Broadcasting the information the mainstream media won't touch. This is The Richie Allen Show in association with DavidIke.com. The former Home Secretary, Alan Johnson, is among those pushing for the fluoridation of the water in Hull. Now, Hull Council have consulted, they say, with dental experts. They agree and plan to roll out a scheme very soon. Asked at the top of the programme, why now? Why is Hull considering this? There is overwhelming evidence, I believe anyway, that fluoride doesn't have a positive effect on teeth and in fact it can be seriously harmful. Let's welcome back to the programme. She was with us back in 2014, it's a long time ago. Uh, Joy Warren, Joy is the Joint Coordinator, uh, the Joint Coordinator of UK Freedom from Fluoride Alliance. And I'm also joined by Steve Dales. Now, uh, Steve lives in Hull and he's very much against this as well. Joy and Steve, welcome to the programme. How are you? Very well, thank you. Welcome, Joy. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Hi, yeah. Nice to hear from you both. Joy, welcome. It's been a long time, Joy. It's been yes, a long I'm time. I'm still here. But you're still <laughs> here. Dating. You're still around. Do you know what? Do you know, when I, I was speaking to a couple of colleagues of mine today, and they hadn't heard about this, and they expressed the same surprise as I did. They said, well, you know, did you, the cat's out of the bag now with fluoride. You know, it, you know, we're seeing a rollback against the fluoridation of water around the world. What's going on? Why now? What's going on in Holjoy? Um, I have no idea. Well, I have an idea, but it's not a fact. So I couldn't actually tell you about my theories, or could I? Yeah, let's, let me tell you about your theories. Um, Alan Johnson has always been in favour of fluoridation, and he has a colleague of Andy Burnham, who is also very much in favour of fluoridation, and Andy Burnham was, um, how can I say, persuaded when he was on the health committee back in 2000. Um, the leader of the Labour um, committee, um, Health and Wellbeing Committee in Hull is also very much in favour of fluoridation. And they're all three, presumably, have been talking and they've been uh, persuaded by Public Health England, which is strangely in favour of fluoridation. Uh, and yeah. they will not listen to anything, again, any of our arguments um, against the practice. You know, they, they... About, you know what's incredible about this, Joy? Something as massive as that, the medication of people, because that's what you're yeah. talking about, is even if, even if I'm wrong and you're wrong and fluoride is perfectly safe, the goal of these people to say, we can put stuff in your water without getting your permission to do so. They are permitted to do so by law, and that's the 1991 Water Industries Act, which was up amended um, in 2003, I think, by the Health and Social Care Act. Um, well, fluoridating water companies don't have a choice now. If they're told to do it, uh, they will have to do it. But you, before you do that, you have to go out to public consultation. So we're at the stage now of waiting for the engineering feasibility study to be requisitioned from Yorkshire Water. Give us That's that in English, Joy. 50,000 50, pounds worth of study. Give us that in English, public consultation. What does that mean exactly, in layman's terms? There isn't a, a laid down way of doing it, but what they did in Southampton was they, they put postcards through people's doors and asked them to sign the postcards, tick a box and send them back in. People who were in the know sent back more than that and they, they, they quoted um, good reasons not to do it. In the end, um, they counted up and crunched the numbers and they found that 72% of people taking part in that consultation were against fluoridation and there the matter should have ended. However, the Strategic Health Authority in Southampton uh, thought better. They said, oh no, there are still good sound reasons for doing it, so we're going to ignore the 72% of people who said they didn't want it wow. and we'll go ahead and fluoridate Southampton. That was in 2009. In 2014, because so many things had changed, um, um, government um, agencies, crankers, which, whatever you call it, changed all over the place. Um, by 2014, they couldn't do it anyway because um, the, the inheritor um, organisation, Public Health England, um, were not involved with the original decision. So in 2014, Southampton was reprieved. It was scrapped. And I remember talking to you about this. Now, just before we bring Steve in, what about Hull City Council? Are, are there yeas and nays, or is it largely the council is positive towards this? Or are there, is there any dissent at all, Joy? The Labour go 
the Labour group have voted to support Colin Inglis um, in his uh, desire to fluoridate all of Hull and part of the East Riding of Yorkshire. Um, uh, it's difficult to say, really, Richie. Yeah. Uh, uh, there is a group of politicians on the council, and they're the Lib Dems, and they are against. Um, there are no independents, I believe. So basically, uh, the Labour group will have the majority every time they vote on it. Let's let's bring in Steve. Steve Dale. Steve, welcome to the program, mate. How are you? You're, well, in, you're in Hull. Yeah, yeah. So you're obviously properly cheesed off about this, Steve. What, 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 how do you feel about this? Um, well, like you said, the main thing is this mass medication of people. I mean, I looked up um, on the NHS website. If you look up, if you just Google like consent to treatment... Um, you have to give, you know, if you're giving somebody a medical treatment for a condition, which it obviously is because you're treating tooth decay, you need um, consent from every individual. And they're not asking that, you know, and, and even then you can say no. You know, even the people who say yes, how can they put it in everybody's water? So for a start, it's it's wrong. But yeah, having looked into it, like other people, you start looking into it. And you look if you look at the, even the official evidence in it, you know, there's obviously lots of different sites that come from different angles, but you look at all the proper research in it, it seems to basically say that the, the evidence for any real benefit is really unclear, and the same with the safety. There, there's a lot of safety issues, which the government is saying, oh, yeah, it's um, safe, but then they list all the things they've looked at, and they don't even look at half the things. They're not even talking about the neurotoxic effect or the thyroid or anything, and, um, you know, the endocrine system, I have a, a pers- personally have a health problem, which, you know, looking at the information could be affected by it, so I don't want it. And I, like you say, why, why should we have stuff added to our water? They add stuff to keep, to kind of get rid of the microbes, but we don't want other chemicals put in. I think that's what most people I've spoken to feel, you know. I was just going to ask you about that. You said most people you've spoken to, Steve. Is it on the minds of people, like your neighbours? And, and, you know, I remember a time when, the local radio stations were owned by business people in that community, not kind of mm. multi-owned as they are now. So this would have been a big topic for discussion on the mid-morning talk shows. Are people talking about it in Hull? Well, there have been some mid-morning talk shows, and um, I rang up on one of them recently, and every single person who rang up, there wasn't anybody who said they wanted it. In fact, people were quite well informed, and they'd done the research like myself, because you can now, you can kind of get directly to scientific studies that have been done can't you and you can find all the the properly peer-reviewed studies that have really gone into it accurately and people were quoting that kind of thing and everybody was quoting these figures saying we don't want it and it's it's bad for you and you know again the the council i think uh, in the report it's kind of misleading because they talk about the um, fluoride being a natural mineral but the substance they're adding is, is those of us who know who've looked into it is actually um, a toxic waste. It's this acid called hexafluorosilicic acid, which is a waste product which is highly expensive to dispose of. So if they didn't work putting it in the water, it would cost them millions to get rid of this stuff. So it's quite convenient for them, really, to be sticking it the in the water. The so, byproduct. Yeah, the byproduct. Yeah. So, so would, before Jai comes back in, would there, would there be, do you think, a possibility that if they go ahead and do this without the consent of people, that people might have to look into some way of taking them, taking them on legally, you know, because well, uh, yeah, yeah, I think there's a the scope for that, and I think that they're not they're not um, aware that that might be a possibility. Pos- po- sorry, possibility because um, they're kind of saying, oh well, it's it's we're doing it already in all these other places. But we're, we're, did any was anybody actually consulted? I, I'm not I'm not sure. You know, in other places in Britain, the few places that do have it. It was years ago, it was back in the 60s, and I don't think there was a proper consultation, if any, of people. And this, um, this consent treatment thing I mentioned, that comes from various in, you know, international human rights standards. So this Water Act, it might say something, but if it actually contradicts international law and it contradicts yeah. things like Medicine Act and whatever from the UK, then, then there's a problem with the law. The, law's, the law can't contradict itself. It has to come out saying one thing or another. So at the moment, there's a contradiction in, in the laws that they've put forward. So I think, this, you know, when there is a contradiction, there is a case for a, a legal, you know, dispute. Absolutely right. Jai, I'd like yeah. you, if, um, if you don't mind, yes. to remind our listeners why this is such a vital issue and why they should be concerned, why anybody should be concerned about ingesting fluoride through your water supply. What is, what is wrong with fluoride? Okay, we are all 
entitled to have potable, wholesome water, and that's what we pay for. But the law contradicts, as Steve just said, contradicts our rights in, for, uh, for, to getting um, pure drinking water according to the drinking water directive. In the acid, they add a hexafluorosilicic acid. There are several co-contaminants. And I've got in front of me British Standard 12175, which lists some of them. And I'll just read them out to you. Antimony, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, lead, mercury, nickel. And there are some more, but they're not actually listed in the British Standard. And they have to be at a certain concentration. They can't be more than that. So if they are more, then the supplying company has to dilute the acid. Also in there, they've got 1.5% hydrogen fluoride. And hydrogen fluoride is implicated in the onset of low thyroid condition. And it was used in 1930s to 1960s by an Austrian physician for reducing overactive thyroid down to normal thyroid condition and it was successful in almost 100% of the time but he sometimes he put, carried on with the treatment a little bit too long and his patients became hypothyroid that's low thyroid and we now know that in um, in fluoridated West Midlands there's almost double the amount of incidences of uh, hyperthyroidism as there is in non-fluoridated Greater Manchester and throughout fluoridated England it's 30% more than in non-fluoridated England. Then we have the um, intelligence uh, research we have com from China. Each time it has been conclusively shown that the fluoride reduces the intelligence of the unborn child and therefore the child is born. Those are two very, very good, strong reasons. We have research, but the Department of Health doesn't want to listen. And they're not prepared to undertake research to, to corroborate the hyperthyroid study, which was done by the University of Kent a couple of years ago. They will not do it because they don't want to find out the truth or they don't want to be seen to find out the truth and then ignore it. Every time we, sh we ask them to do something, to listen to something, to read something, there's denial, denial, denial. And this is why we're so against it, because when you get that problem, when you get this entrenched idea, um, it's sort of like a culture, really, there's going to be something up behind the scenes. There's got to be some hidden agenda. And that's yeah. why we're all against it. It's, it's such a bad, bad uh, inter intervention, and it's violating our human rights. It's just... Um Doing a bit of research today, and it's been a while since I've covered this issue, but um, it's been categorised previously in in this country and in the United States, fluoride as more poisonous than lead, and that's an extraordinary thing. That because I mean I covered a story many years ago of a child who was poisoned by lead, and the damage done to a perfectly uh, healthy two year old child, the brain damage that. Um, unfortunately he experienced because of his exposure to lead in the house mm -hmm. it was extraordinary and it's more poisonous than lead you mentioned arsenic a little bit yes. less poisonous than that Yes, indeed. I mean, arsenic is a very, very emotive thing to talk about. I understand that. But with my British standard in front of me, I am on really solid ground here that they add arsenic to our water supply when they add the fluoridating acid. I can't, fa I can't a, fault you, John. I've got a research report here from the Committee on Toxicity, and it's from uh, 2003. The committee concluded that inorganic arsenic is genotoxic. That's kind of carcinogenic. Um, that destroys the genes, as it were, and a known human carcinogen, and therefore exposure should be as low as is reasonably practicable. As reasonably now, that's practicable. a sound principle called ALARP, and it's so easy to reduce the levels of arsenic in drinking water by not putting it in deliberately. Just don't put it when in they there. Are, right, exactly. Let me bring Steve back in. Steve, have you got children? Yeah, yeah. Because I'm just thinking... If I mean, we know what these organisations are like, we know what governments are like, if they go ahead and roll this out, you're effectively going to have to start, you're going to be paying for your water, like it or lump it, so you'll get your water bill twice a year, but you're going to have to be buying in gallons of bottled water, right? Yeah, and, um, you know, that's, you know, if you're against sort of 
carbon footprints and all the rest of it. We don't really want to be, you know, that's ex- that's bad on the environment when you're chipping water about. And Especially in plastic. You've got, to, you've got to vet where it's coming from, you, you know. Because at this, expense. that's right. Because listeners are very interested in this. They're they're um, they're tweeting about it. There's a couple of studies that have been tweeted. I'm tweeting them. Go to Richie Allen Show on Twitter if you want to follow what other listeners are saying, um, and you can debate with them on there. Joseph tweets: Can you ask Steve and Joy what the best way is to consume water? The bottle brand reverse osmosis uh, as two. Uh, possible suggestions. Joy, what do you think? Just buy bottled water. But as Steve said, you've got that environmental impact. You've got plastic, which we don't want to be using anyway. What do you say, Joy? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. The plastic bottles contain phthalates, which are hormone disruptors. Um, I, I, I do both. I have reverse osmosis and I buy bottled water. And I've also got a distillation unit. All have their advantages and their disadvantages. For example, distillation costs money in electricity. And reverse osmosis gives you a very pure water, so you really ought to add a pinch of bicarb to it to add back the electrolytes. Um, and as far as bottled water is concerned, yep, I've done a survey of all the fluoride content of every single water we can buy in this country. Most of them are very, very, very low in natural fluoride, so there's no co-contaminants like arsenic in there. Groundwater is the purest you can get. And I noticed that one of the water treatment works um, north of Hull, which would be fluoridating, is using groundwater, which is so pure. This beautiful, pure Yorkshire water could possibly be contaminated with arsenic. Wow. Terrible. So, at the end of the day, it's, you know, you, you, pay, you, you pay for the bottled water. It's heavy, five litres for a pound and ten pence. Or you pay for what, um, reverse osmosis, which is 120 pounds um, as a starter pack, plus plumbing in. Or you buy a distillation unit, which costs about 100, 120 pounds. But then you're going to be paying for the electricity. The electricity unless, you've to run, solar, yeah. unless you've got solar panels, you know, you're going to be paying for electricity for that. So it's, you know, all three methods are good, but, but um, they cost let me um, Let me just do a quick recap. If you just joined the programme, Joy Warren, the Joint Coordinator of UK Freedom from Fluoride Alliance, is on uh, the line. And we've also got Steve Dale. Steve is a Hull resident. Uh, there is a plan to roll out a fluoridation scheme in Hull. Uh, former Home Secretary Alan Johnson among the people supporting it there. It's come up on this programme over the years. Uh, the toxicity of fluoride, uh, as eloquently described a couple of minutes ago by Joy, it's, it's, it's dreadful. It's, it's poison. It's medication, not by stealth, but by, well, basically by the jackboot. And, and, and that won't suit some people. They don't like those images. But we know that it was given to uh, prisoners in concentration camps to... Um, to make them acquiesce, to keep them docile. This is an absolute fact. Steve, what do you do now, um, between now and the time they announce that they're going to start, you know, basically adding it to the water? Do you try and continue? Do you, do you try and educate people about it, knock on doors, wake people up to it? What do you do from here, Steve? No, I know. I guess so. I mean, the thing is, there will be a public consultation, but it's not beyond the realms of possibility because this, I've, you know, Joel probably know better than me if she's de- dealing with this nationally. But it's, you know, from what I've heard, you get some of these groups in favour, like some of the dental groups, and they start kind of put publishing documents saying fluoridation the facts because we actually found there's one on Alan Johnson's website. And if you look, they're not. There's hardly any facts on there. In fact, lots of them are the complete opposite, and they don't even quote where they get the information from. I mean, and that's the problem, that a lot of the average person doesn't have time to look into this. And if they, they just listen to what they're told by the people in authority, they think, well, they must be telling the truth. But the reality is, as we knew even with the Brexit thing, a lot, a lot of the figures we were given weren't accurate. And this is the, the thing people need to wake up yeah. to, really. It's a case of waking up generally, I think, for people, that they've actually got to really research something. If it's such an important decision, it's going to affect everybody's drinking water. It's... It's kind of the responsibility of everybody, not that people have got time or the inclination, but they need to, you know, they need to start looking into these things. And, you know, like on the thing on Alan Johnson's website saying all, about all the facts, it says it benefits adults' teeth for a start. And the, the major review that's just been done said there isn't any real evidence. No evidence. That, you know, they've not found any evidence to that. You've maybe looked into some of that as well. It's called the Cochrane Review. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I advise anybody to read read it. You know, it's quite clearly the conclusions are quite easy to read. And um, previous reviews that have been done by the NHS tend to conclude similar things, and they talk about improving um, children's teeth in poor areas, but again, the evidence isn't there. You know, all these things are kind of either taken out of context 
all the evidence doesn't even seem to be there. And I've looked uh, at some of these Public Health England reports that are pr proposing it, and they give you their references. And when you actually look at the reports they've used to justify them, the ones that haven't even, they've actually failed the selection criteria for the actual official scientific reviews that have been done into water fluoridation because they're too biased or they haven't taken, you know, the, the sample. And Steve, hang been, on a second. Um, and those are being presented as fact then, as mitigating facts. That's right. Right. Yeah, they're yeah. cherry picking information that isn't even accurate or it's highly biased um, studies which haven't been properly peer reviewed or whatever, you know, if you start looking into it. It actually spells it all out in this Cochrane review and in, I think, the York review. They actually spell out what's a bias study and what isn't, and you can read all about it. It's a lot of reading, obviously, but they explain all the different reasons why um, a conclusion might be biased if there's not actually looked at all the other factors that lead up to it. So they'll often quote really old studies on fluoride before we had fluoride in toothpaste, and there is some link, but in terms of water, there didn't seem to be the evidence. You know, there seems to be some evidence, you know, maybe John know better than me in terms of how it affects the surface of teeth done by dentists. But even that, even looking into that personally, I haven't found too much evidence of it. The, the thing that seems the best way of preventing tooth decay seems to be just better education about diet and trying to avoid all the sugar that's in a lot of the processed food. I mean, I um, don't use fluoride. I've never used fluoridated toothpaste and... Um, I um I eat fairly well. I've never had a filling, so and you know it's obviously not through lack of fluoride. No, certainly not. Uh, Joy, we've got about two minutes left on this. Couple of questions. Um, yes. One um, listeners are asking about bathing in it and showering in it, and then um, when you answer that, if you can let us know what people listening to shows like this uh, can do about it. Um, before we run out of time, go ahead, Joy. Okay, right. I would not wish to have a hot bath in my house if I lived in Hull and I was fluoridated because that's the way you can get the hydrofluoric acid into the skin. It's absorbed very easily and that's the way this Austrian doctor managed to cure his patients. He gave them hot hydrofluoric acid baths and there's 1.5% hydrogen fluoride, hydrofluoric acid in the fluoridating acid. So, if you are fluoridated, opt for warm showers. As far as going to the bars, I'm not quite sure, but I suspect it's not so bad because the temperature is much lower. Your temperature is high in the hot bath and your pores are opened. Yeah. What can people do? Right, as soon as the consultation is announced, everybody has to write to the local authority and blast them with lots of facts and they have to back up those facts with references. There's not much point saying, I don't want to be fluoridated, full stop. They have to say, because, da di da di da and here's the reference. This is how Southampton was almost fluoridated because the um, Strategic Health Authority said, oh, those people haven't, haven't given us references, so they're not exactly informed. Um, it wasn't informed withdrawal of consent, so therefore we're going to ignore them. So you have to be cute here. You have to write intelligently. You have to say what references. And I think by the time we get to that, if we do, we will be putting onto our websites the whole list of references and the reasons, and everybody will be invited to um, form a letter around the facts and the references. And that that's what we can do. Great, yeah. Joy. And, and finally, give us those website details. I'll be tweeting them out anyway. Go ahead. Right, so it's Hull for Pure Water. I don't have the actual um, URL here. Then there's uh, www.wmaf.org.uk. And then there's the UK Alliance, um, UK Freedom from Fluoride Alliance. That's easy to just put that in and they'll find Fantastic. it. Fantastic. It's a, new, it's a, it's a new website and it's still information. But it we'll is be, new. I'm going to tweet it we'll out get now. It ready. Great stuff. And the Twitter account is at Hull4. That's the, that's the number four. At Hull4 Pure Water. At Hull4 Pure Water is the Twitter account. Um, Joy, thanks for coming on the programme. And Steve Dales, great to have you on. Good luck with that and stay in touch with us. Oh, All thank right, you. Cheers. Great Bye. stuff. Bye. Bye for now. Uh, Joy Warren there. And uh, Steve Dales, Joy, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, is the Joint Coordinator of UK Freedom from Fluoride Alliance. Steve is a concerned and obviously very well informed resident of Hull. That scheme, uh, supported by people like Alan Johnson to roll out fluoridation in Hull, it's um, deadly serious. I mean, it really is. Uh, my friend and colleague, Jean Ann, 
has said to me, it's one of the reasons, let me just uh, go up there, fluoride is a toxic waste product. Most EU countries don't have it. That's true. Ireland does. Don't know why, but we do. And no one is seriously question, questioning it yet. Is they need to get the info on why it's damaging first. No doubt about it. And she has the reverse osmosis system herself that takes it and chlorine out. Uh, or so she believes, uh, says Jean Anne. I reckon if it's if it's operational, Jean Anne, it definitely is taken out the chlorine and the fluoride. Mm-hmm.